Hello, everybody. Falchas Fijerov, you're all very welcome to the special UCD Vet School webinar to celebrate International Women's Day. And I, my name is Michael Doherty, and I'm the Dean. Choose to challenge outstanding women in veterinary medicine. That's the title of our special webinar. Um, I'm going to introduce some folk now. Um, firstly, the co-chairs of our Athena Swan Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Dr. Kleena Skelly and Dr. Steve Gordon. Kleena is a diagnostic, diagnostic imaging lead in the vet hospital and Steve is professor of infection biology in the school. I would like to sincerely thank them, along with all the members of our Athena Swan Committee, um, particularly Jenny Caffrey and everyone who contributed to organizing this event. Thanks also to David Karskaden. Now I'd like to int introduce our three panelists. Delia Grace Randolph. Delia graduated MVB in 1990. She's professor of food safety at the University of Greenwich, a veterinary epidemiologist with 20 years experience in developing countries. Delia leads research on zoonosis and foodborne disease at the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya, where she now is. Delia was a recipient of the 2020 UCD Alumni Award in Health and Agricultural Sciences. You're very welcome, Delia, and thank you for joining us. Kira Feeney Reed graduated MVB in 1996. Kira is a veterinary practitioner, practice manager, and chair of the Farm Animal Welfare Advisory Group formerly both the youngest ever and the first female president of Veterinary Ireland, the professional body in Ireland. Kira is a mother of a child with special needs who overcame special health challenges. Patricia Riley graduated MVB in 1996. She's head of the Animal Welfare Division in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Patricia spent 10 years in Brussels, first as a member of cabinet with Commissioner Myra Gagan Quinn, and then as Deputy Head of Cabinet for EU Commissioner for Education, Culture, Youth and Sport. A graduate of the King's Inns, Patricia was Ireland's first agricultural attaché in Central Eastern Europe. Manan Heron, three simple Irish words meaning the woman of Ireland. Three simple Irish words that former Uchtaran the Heron, Mary Robertson made very special. And today we have three very special Women of Ireland, three outstanding women who are graduates of this proud School of Veterinary Medicine. Three women who chose to challenge. Agini Ushla Harja, Kurinche Glinder Kriorimsa, La Adder Nashington, the man of Hyalulyev, Siskal Tredlita. I'm delighted to introduce and launch this wonderful webinar on International Women's Day. And I would now like to hand over to Dr. Kleenis Skelly. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Michael. And so I also would like to th thank the three speakers today or the three panelists um, uh, as part of the Athena Swan Committee with Steve and I are very grateful for giving up your time. Um, we actually slightly expanded our name. So we're now the Athena Swan and um, Equality, um, Inclusion and Diversion Committee. So we're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're Professor of Committee, sorry. We're, and we're really expanding our, our remit, but our Underlying premise is always going to be the same. It's about inclusion, it's about equality. It's about trying to make people feel it's important, no matter where you're from or what gender you are. So as part of that, on International Women's Day, we're going to have you know, a discussion about just the careers that you've had and some of the challenges you've faced and how it's worked in, um, and how you've managed to kind of cope with these challenges and, and face them and, and progress your careers through many of them. So I don't know who would like to start, but I suppose maybe a, a brief kind of personal synopsis of where you've come and how you've managed to be where you are would be a good start. I don't know, um, maybe Kira, would you like to start and then we'll go from there. I will indeed. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's sort of, you know, it, it's quite humbling when you see the title Outstanding Women in, in Veterinary. And I, I think, you know, probably one of the first challenges we all face is you don't look upon yourself like that. So um, very nice to think somebody looks upon me like that. So yeah, so I started off as a lot of my classmates did back in the 90s that um, got in the boat and went to the UK and I was in a lovely mixed practice, um, a mixed practice where I was very fortunate to have had two female colleagues before me. 
Um, I was the little girl from the north side of Dublin and I ended up in an absolutely gorgeous dairy practice in the Midlands in the UK. There was two past presidents of BCVA and I was doing probably about 60% dairy work, which was nearly the, the joke of our class that, as I said, the little girl from Dublin was, was doing some really high class dairy work. Um, after I left there, I moved home. Um, and I moved home to lovely practice in West Dublin in Castleknock. And I was there for four years and very happy in small animal practice. And then I reached the, the 10 year rich. I was 10 years graduated. And the question is, what, what do you do with your career next? And I suppose anybody who's been in practice has found that there's few options when you're in practice is you're either an assistant or you're a partner. So I took the decision at that stage to leave practice and I moved into industry. And I was with Intervet, who's now MSD, and I think there was something else before, before that, um, as their companion animal technical advisor, looking after the companion animal portfolio, which was small animals and, and equine. And that was a really interesting job. It took me on the road nearly every week, meeting plenty of vets around, around the country. Um, but after a few years of, of being there, I was tired of being in a hotel room um, at least once, if not two or three times a, a week. Um, so I stayed in the industry and I joined Hills Pet Nutrition uh, as their um, advisor and um, area manager for essentially the greater pale um, as it was. And I was with them for years. And along the way, I had my family. So I had um, two, I have two lovely girls. Um, Dervil is eight and Frailteen is five and a half now. And I had just gone back to work. I'd been, I had, uh, Railteen was born with Down syndrome. And along the way, we found out that Railteen had a congenital heart defect and was going to need heart surgery. And then we found out she had a congenital bowel defect and she was going to need bowel surgery. And then we found out that she's profoundly deaf and I had to advocate for her and get her into the cochlear implant program in, in Beaumont. And then because of her heart and because um, she also had obstructive sleep apnea, nobody in Temple Street where they do the cochlear implant surgery wanted to anaesthetize her. So I spent nearly six months trying to find an anaesthetist who would take, take her on. So. I am an advocate of, of the new hospital to have all, all the disciplines under the one roof. I won't get into James's issue. Um, and anyway, she got, got her cochlear implant surgery, which is just absolutely amazing. So I was off for the best part of two years between maternity leave and carer's leave. And I, had, I was back in work three months and um, we got the news that no, no parent wants. We found out that Renteen had leukemia. And it wasn't even the leukemia that's attached to the, the Down syndrome chromosome. It was just a really bad luck leukemia. Um, and childhood cancer is brutal, absolutely brutal. Um, my husband at the time was out of work. And as much as I wanted to work to be at her bedside, um, it just all, all fell apart. And we, you know, there was numerous times where we nearly lost her. So working full time just wasn't wasn't going to work. Unfortunately, with Hills, there was not the option of a part time job. So I made the decision to leave and went back and was doing a bit of locoming. So I was delighted that I had never lost my clinical skills. And then the following year, I joined Arcvet Care in South County Dublin as their practice manager. And I was very lucky to have two employers who understood that I had a child with a lot of additional needs. I had an awful lot of hospital appointments and um, we had an awful lot of hospital stays, but they were able to give me the um, flexibility to, to work around hospital. Um, this year, we well, next this month, actually, we're a year chemo free and all the yellow bins are gone, gone out of the house and we have an awful lot less, less appointments. And we're first busy in practice and it's very hard to recruit vets at the moment. So um, if anybody's looking for a job, please contact me. I have four going. 
Um, so I'm back doing quite a bit of clinical work at the moment, as well as um, my job as practice manager. So that's that's where I've been for the past 25 years. So I think if you're going to actually say choose to challenge there, I think you might just be challenging no matter what. <laughs> I think that might have been maybe a, a better thing. So I know I know Patricia is was in the same class as you, so we might have a break from your year and we'll go and talk to Delia and see just maybe a little bit about Delia and, and how you've come to be where you are, maybe it's a good way of looking at it. So do you unmute Delia, sorry. Hello everyone. I was one of the, I think now extinct generations of vets where we were about 66% male and one third female. I, I believe now it's in, in most of America, Europe, UK, Ireland, it's kind of 70, 80% female. Um, uh, and like, like, like uh, the speaker before me, it was a time when employment was not good. So as soon as I graduated, I got on the boat and went over to a nice practice in Lancashire. <laughs> Again, it was mainly dairy. Uh, challenges and, and advantages. You know, th there's no way I could carve a cow like, like some of the, the big lads could, some of the, 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 the male vets. I might just couldn't reach in that far. I couldn't pull that hard. Uh, of course, you have, you have you know, t tools and calvers and stuff. But if I had a hard time, I would have to call a man, uh, which is, of course, always uh, embarrassing. On the other hand, if they had a hard lambing, you know, they would have to call me because th their hands couldn't even get into a yow, <laughs> much less manipulate a lamb inside her. So it was kind of a, a, a one for one. Uh, it, it was a farm animal practice. Uh, I really enjoyed it. The farmers were great. I must say I had the advantage uh, too of having a Dutch lady vet before me who had clear, cleared the minds of every man in the district that she couldn't. Uh, I think she was about eight foot tall and, and passed as a gorilla in her spare time. But anyway, she, she, she cleared the minds of everyone in the district that women could not do large animals, which is still a bit of a, 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 well, at that time, I don't know now, but 20 years ago, it was certainly a bit of a myth that women couldn't do large animal practice, that they were fine for small animal, but they couldn't handle the large. Um, so I had her as my predecessor. Um, after five years, uh, I loved the place. I loved the practice. I loved the farmers. I was offered, uh, I was offered a partnership and I knew if I accepted that I would be there for the rest of my life. So I went off to work for, uh, $90 a month as a volunteer in Bangladesh, uh, in order to change, you know, change the atmosphere a bit and see some other things. And that took me onto the second strand of my career which was first of all working with NGOs and then going on to do a master's and then a PhD, all based basically in, in, in overseas uh, livestock. And that's, that's where I've been and where I am. Uh, originally, I was working more in kind of um, cattle disease. Uh, and in the last 15 years, I've been focusing on food safety. Um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, as I say to everyone, it, it opens so many doors and it's such a fun career and you, you can make of it what you will. So uh, uh, being very interesting and no regrets. Thank you. Well, well you were lucky because I went to practice in Scotland and the female before me had alienated all the men. <laughs> so when I arrived, it wasn't the same open door policy. It was a lot of, a lot of work to get um, women recognised in practice. So. Um, sorry, Patricia, um, we can come to you maybe and, and if you want to talk about how you've changed um, into. OK, well, yeah, thank, thanks, Cleana. And yeah, like like the others, I've, I'm delighted to join you and flattered to be asked. Um, my career has been a bit of a bit of a, a strange one in a way, I suppose, for a veterinary graduate. But I, as you say, I graduated the same year as Kira, having taken quite a circuitous route through college and I'm uh, I'm very glad to say that I eventually managed to get out the right end of the, the course. And I really haven't looked back since I went. Um, my first job was down in Spanish Point in County Clare. And Kira used the word lucky uh, a few times and I, I'm going to do the same. I was very lucky. I had a great first boss. Um, he, and I think 
if we ever have to give anybody advice about their first job, it's it's choose wisely as to who your first boss is, because they will make or break you, really, or they certainly can. Um, I suppose somewhere in the middle between between you and and Kira or and Delia in terms of being sort of in a practice that was used to women. This particular practice wasn't used to women, but I have to say the farmers, with a few notable exceptions, were um, were okay. You know, they they took me as as they found me, and uh, if you were good at the job, then that was fine. So I wasn't there for terribly long. Um, I went home and took over my dad's practice um, and worked there in Cavan in mixed practice, mostly mostly large animal practice, mostly cattle tossing, truthfully, <laughs> uh, which I loved actually. But after after a, uh, I don't know, five or six years, maybe I, I started to think about where I wanted to be and whether I wanted to do this forever. Um, and the department was recruiting at that stage. And for a lot of reasons that I could spend an hour talking about, I decided to apply for, for a job at the department. Um, and I was offered a job. And I still wasn't at all sure that I wanted to take it. It was just a, you know, to have a card in, in, in your hand, if you like. Um, and I went to talk to my dad, who was still alive at the time. And I had, as I said, taken over his practice. And it was a huge thing for me to even open up the conversation with him that I might be thinking about leaving veterinary or leaving practice. It wasn't leaving veterinary at all, but leaving practice. And I couldn't believe how encouraging he was. He, he was really incredibly positive, not about leaving practice, but about, about just going, plowing your own furrow, which I think was really, really important. So I joined the department. I joined in March 2001, which everybody will remember was Foot and Mouth Central. So I, I, I often say I'm one of the few people who really benefited from Foot and Mouth because I was thrown in very much at the deep end. I was recruited into the National Disease Control Centre in Agriculture House. So um, it was really at the eye of the storm. And um, I was lucky because I was given probably far more responsibility than anybody should be given when they walk in the door and they're five minutes recruited. Um, I was in Brussels going to meetings. I was, I was doing radio interviews. I was doing stuff that nobody else had time to do, <laughs> basically, which was great. So I spent a few years in the NDCC. Um, and then there was a, an ad posted on the intranet um, asking for people to express interest in taking up attache jobs. Now, I'm not sure, there might have been one or two vets who had been agricultural attaches before me. There had been, yes, of course there had. Yeah, no, Anne Darwin being the notable person and her husband, Joe, subsequently. Um, but there hadn't been that many of us. So I. I did the interviews and I remember a colleague of mine saying um, there were four jobs on offer at the time and a colleague of mine saying you might get one of them um, but you won't get the, you won't get the Brussels job that'll never be given to a vet and I also got from somebody else there'll be the skirt factor so they'll have to take a couple of women onto the panel so both of those things made me furious like really furious um, Anyway, uh, I, I didn't get the Brussels job. The reason I didn't get the Brussels job was because I didn't want the Brussels job and I turned it down. I could have taken it, which was quite gratifying. And I went off instead to Warsaw. Um, and I remember Breed Cannon, God rest her, she's, she's no longer with us, but she was one of the people on the interview board who asked me, she, I ran into her the day after the results of the competition came out and she said, you know, are you really going to take that job in Brussels? I mean, did you just say that in the interview? to kind of make make yourself stand out and look a bit different. <laughs> I said, not at all, I'm going to go. So went off to Warsaw. I'd never been to Poland before, so it was probably a bit foolhardy. Um, and spent four years as Agatashe in Warsaw, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and it really broadened my the scope of what I what I thought I could do with myself uh, in the sense that I had been working in veterinary all of my professional career at that stage but when you're in a small embassy you get thrown into doing everything you know you're doing consular work you're doing political work you're doing everything that had anything remotely sciencey at all Trish got asked to do because nobody else had anything to do with science and I suppose that's something I would say is you know being 
a vet or being from a scientific background, you're quite an unusual creature in an awful lot of outside world things. Um, and it can be very much to your benefit. Came back from Warsaw after four years, back to the department. Um, again, working in, uh, it was just around the time of the crash. So it was a tough enough time to be in the civil service, even tougher time to be in the private sector, I expect. Um, but there were cuts and there were all sorts of things going on, which I was very much part of implementing. So that wasn't particularly easy. Um, and I, when I was back about a year, less than a year and a half, I suppose, I had taken a half day. It was just before Christmas. And I had the promise of a long boozy lunch with a friend of mine who was working for the drinks industry at the time. And we had just had a gin and tonic and we were about to sit down to our starter and the phone rang and I saw it was Paddy Rogan, another man who's no longer with us. Um, and I thought, crikey, Paddy doesn't often ring me. I better answer this. So um, he said, do you have a CV? <laughs> I said, well, kind of, sort of, you know, I'd have to dust it down and update it and stuff. And he said, well, get it into me by five o'clock. So um, I jettisoned the lunch and went back to back to the office and tidied up the CV. And that took me to Brussels. Um, I joined Maura Gagan Quinn's cabinet. Um, she wanted, she was very clear about what she wanted in her team. The uh, commissioner's cabinet is between six and seven people. At that time we had seven. Um, and she was very clear that she wanted a woman. She wanted gender balance on her team. So one of the people she was looking for was a woman, but she wanted a woman who was also an Irish civil servant because she felt that Irish civil servant had a particular ethos and she wanted somebody who would deal with the farmers because she <laughs> you may remember there was a lot of controversy at the time about whether or not she was going to take the portfolio of agriculture commissioner and I suppose we'll never really know the truth whether it was on the table and she told them where to go or whether <laughs> whether she was uh, given the research and innovation portfolio um, in any case, I ended up working with her for five years and that was fantastic. And I was ready to come home at the end of that, um, but then I was offered a job and ended up deputy head of cabinet for the Hungarian commissioner um, who was responsible for education, culture, youth and sport with a great big science bit in the, me in the meantime. And then 10, 10 years passed, I was in Brussels and um, I, at that stage I had done something in excess of a thousand flights I figured over the previous decade and I had a long suffering husband still living back in Ireland that you know one of us was in an airport every weekend um, so I decided it was time to come home and came home just over a year ago beginning of the pandemic something dramatic happens every time I move country basically um, and I spent the guts of a year working with directly with the CVO in workforce planning and a bit of strategic thinking that sounds bigger than it is. Um, and since the end of October last, I've been head of division responsible for animal welfare. It's a new animal welfare division in the department. So yeah, that's my story so far. <laughs> and very interesting it is as well. <laughs> so we have a very strong um, work ethic I think from all of you and I think we all started or a lot of us have started off in general practice and have branched out I, th I think the versatility that, we've, that we can show from that and, and the qualification really does lend itself to kind of going in many directions um, and so I think when somebody's qualifying it's, it's the beginning of a journey that could go anywhere and I, I think that's really important to say um, in terms of I suppose your biggest challenges you know what is the thing that you you found the, the most difficult um, I suppose kind of as a being a, a vet and, and trying to transition um you know did you, you know, what would you say I don't know who wants to start first but what would you say is the biggest challenge that you've had to to face and and deal with you know I think the first six months in practice uh were, were really <laughs> maybe it was my fault maybe I wasn't a good enough student but but I I just felt that uh and also I was sort of going from a different culture from Ireland to England. Uh, and um, those first six months, I, I just really felt almost every, every day I, I, that, I, that I really was struggling to cope. Uh, I, I would say I'm somebody who's kind of, you know, I was brought up in, in, in the Catholic tradition, but I'm, I'm now somewhere 
in between. Uh, but but I remember going home those first few nights and, and, and praying for the health of some of the animals I had treated because I wasn't I wasn't really sure if if my if what my treatment was enough to see them through the night. Uh, but then after about going into three to four years, uh, so much of it became very routine, especially because I was doing fairly large animal most of the time. And, you know, if it cost more than a few hundred dollars, a few hundred pounds, uh, the farmers weren't interested. They, it, it was pay them, it was more economically efficient to shoot them than to us to do, you know, heroic so surgery on them. So after the first, I would say maybe three years, then things started to get a little bit it was the same thing over and over again and like I hear some of our other speakers saying that was when I started to thinking uh you know and, and there was always that argument when get, getting to be a vet at, at, at that time was harder to become a, a vet than it was to become a doctor in terms of your 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 high school scores um there was always this argument you know are we over educating a generation of people who are not actually going to stay in practice and I, it, I seem to, find, well, you seem to have found at least two of us who are, uh, you know, overeducated beyond the requirements of, uh, of practice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Clean. I think I certainly found out when I was starting in practice, the hardest things was, um, as I said, the little girl from the north, north side of Dublin and people would smile at you and go, are you on work experience? And, you know, are, are you Mr. Pickett's daughter? And, you know, you sort of, you, you have to physically put yourself out there and say, no, actually, I'm the vet. Um, it's me who's, who's looking after you um, today. Or the other common one was, was people presumed you were the nurse and, and not the vet. Um, I suppose a, a, a funny challenge that I had wasn't particularly funny at the, the time. Um, the 5th of January 2001, that's how well I remember the day. Um, a snowy morning and it was a fairly routine call that I had done before. A whole load of heifers on a superovulation program. And I had to go out and give them a shot of, of prostaglandin. But I was a bit earlier than the farmers expected me. And they'd all just been fed. So their heads were all, all in being fed. I said, oh, we'll do them as, as they are. We won't bother running them through, through the crush. Anyway, to cut a long story short, my foolishness and my laziness left me getting a foot in the chest from a heifer. And she, she did some fairly serious damage to me. I had eight broken ribs and fractured sternum and a hematoma in my liver and bruised kidney and what have you. Um, but the biggest hassle was, as I said, it was the 5th of January when I was dressed up like the Michelin man. Um, when the radiographer went to x-ray me, I was asked, did I have an underwired bra on? To which the answer was yes. So she was a little bit flummoxed as to what she was going to do. Now, the ambulance crew had managed to get my waterproofs and wellies off before they got me into the ambulance. But I had um, I had a jacket. I had my boiler suit, I had a jumper, I had a shirt, I had a polo neck, I had a t-shirt, I had, presume, a, a terrible vest as well, um, and they had to hike everything off me to get the bra off to get, um, get my chest x-rayed. So I'm hoping none of our male colleagues have ever faced that particular challenge in practice. <laughs> I wasn't even working hard enough, Kira. I would have definitely lost some of those layers when I was going around the cattle. <laughs> so. There was a lot of snow on the ground too. A <laughs> lot, 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 lot of snow. Um, but look, you know, I've, I've touched on it already that um, my biggest challenge was, and I think, you know, any parent to a very, very sick child has to make the decision, you know, how do you keep the mortgage paid? How do you keep food on the table? But at the same time, you want to be sat beside your child's bed. And like that particular year, we did 200 nights in Crumlin Hospital. And that was just the nights that we had plenty of days where we were in for checkups, for chemo, for bloods, for what, whatever it, it may be. So literally most of that, that year we were in, in Crumlin. Um, and as, as you said, Clean, I certainly didn't, didn't choose it. And um, I didn't 
cope particularly well that you know as I said I was I was very humbled by the title of today's talk um but no that year I didn't cope that I had I had run out of resilience that we had had so many things thrown in our way and I'd fought off those those challenges before and that year I just you know I ended up in hospital myself a couple of times that I literally just hit hit rock bottom um and I suppose what really got me back on on my feet was my family, my very good friends, Trish being being one of them, um, who literally picked me back up and put me back together and helped me make decisions about what we do going going forward. Um, so I think you know we have to. I think any working mother, whether you're in the veterinary profession or, or not, is challenged with what, what do you do? And sometimes there isn't an easy answer. Um, and going back to what we've all, all said is starting off with clinical skills left me in an absolutely fantastic position that it gave me options. Um, the fact that I knew most of the vets around Dublin anyway, and most people were looking for the odd locum here and there, um, it was it made me very fortunate. Well, I certainly think when you say uh, challenging, I think that you, uh, when you say you really survived it, I think you more than did that. I think you, you've shown a, you know real resilience that I mean I. I totally take my hat off to you. It's it's amazing, it really is. So I think you definitely deserve the outstanding title that you that was assigned to you. Um, Trish, do you want to do you want to come in and? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's very humbling to listen to 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 Kira, um, and you know, she talks about not coping very well. I mean, I'm without turning it into a a fan club. I mean, seriously. Coping for me is not about being Iron Woman and being exactly the same as you were when there was no problem. It's just getting out the other end of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, Kira did. I mean, for me, overcoming challenges, I think that sort of the, 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 the constant challenge in life when you challenge yourself is leaving stuff behind and prioritizing, you know, what's important. Uh, you can, like the idea that anybody can have it all and I think this is one of the one of the things it's, it's a bit of, it's cliched but there's a reason cliches exist you know because they're generally truisms to some extent the idea of women who can have it all and Sheryl Sandberg telling people to lean in and just take on more responsibility and take on more challenges that that's a very short piece of string for me uh, you know you can't have it all you can make choices and you can prioritize and you'll have to leave things behind. Like I, I had to leave practice behind and there are days I still regret that. You know, I, I, I loved practice, um, but I wanted something else more. Um, so I think being a little bit ruthless with yourself, maybe, um, and putting the important things first. And they don't always stay on the top of the pile. They can, they can, they can be relegated by something else, either in your professional or your private life. And it can seem really hard to make those changes. But I think uh, for me, if if you want something new and it's really important, then it's probably important to let something else go as well. Yeah, and I think it's also about sort of recognizing different sorts of privilege. Uh, so, w when I was working as a vet in large animal practice, um, to be sure there was some male privilege, that there was some uh, preference and feeling that men were better at doing some things than women were. And some of it was actually correct, they, they were. Um, I, I, the feeling when you, you went into that barn and saw 20 lame cows li lined up to have their who's trimmed I mean that 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 really was a heart sink moment um and then there are different privileges there's also kind of you know uh, race privileges and and, and wealth privileges I, I found that very much as I said my first job for three years was working for 90 dollars a month as a volunteer in a strongly Muslim society and I I I never came I I, I across so much sexism, I would say every day I, I was um, groped or shouted at or, you know, some other thing. But then when 
when I became a, a professor <laughs> and I'm you know going to the same countries uh, with as a principal investigator on projects I, I'm insulated I don't get any of that uh, harassment or, or maybe it's just because I'm 20 years older it's it's hard to say uh, but I, I think it, it really especially as we kind of advance in our careers we we need to remember and to think about other people who are not in positions I mean but and some of the, the stories of the challenges which you, you girls have faced and you ladies have faced are far beyond what I faced um, but at the same time, I think we need to keep, as, as they say in America, keep keep checking your privilege and and trying to, to remember where you came from and where you are. Thanks. Yeah, and I think a lot of people at the moment, especially with COVID and, and what's happened, I think a lot of people are finding it very challenging, you know, from a mental point of view and from losing support systems and from the isolation they're having. So I think I think there are different types of challenges. There's kind of the ones that are big, you've no choice and you have to kind of get over or keep going or try. Uh, and then there's kind of the challenges that you, that you embrace because you want to change. But there's also the challenges that are kind of thrust upon you from, from your life at the moment. And I think a lot of especially I suppose if you look at some of the things in terms of gender equality and how women are kind of now producing less research and getting less research grants from since COVID because of a change in balance. So I think a lot of things can change um, change that, that balance that's kind of very, very um, you know, um, precarious, I suppose is, is, is the way to put it. Um, in terms of, um, do you think that, that Let's say, I suppose we could talk about gender, or you can put any uh, any other equalities if you want, or inequalities if you want. But do you think that women now have it easier or harder, or it's just different? I suppose that's that's the way to <laughs> to phrase it. Trisha, do you want to start? Because you, you can any questions. I I can if you like. Yeah. Um. In some ways, I suppose we have it easier. Um. Like when. When I was, a, I was a teenager when Anne Lovett died giving birth in a cold church graveyard just a few down, miles down the road from where I grew up and contraception and divorce were illegal and marriage equality hadn't even been thought about. Uh, so there's no question but that it's a better place now. But on the other hand, I think young women now face challenges that we never did with social media and all the challenges that that brings and and the world is a deeply unequal place still. I mean, Delia is absolutely right. We're a very privileged lot here, you know, in Zoom land this afternoon. We live in a relatively equal society. But I mean, even at that, young women in Ireland are twice as likely to be subjected to sexual harassment and violence than women on average. So young women between 18 and 34 and they're almost twice as likely to have experienced sexual har harassment as their male counterparts. Um, and we shouldn't forget that 130 million girls globally don't receive the education that their male counterparts receive simply because they're girls. Sometimes it's just too dangerous for them to go to school. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Um, things like, like physical and sexual violence and coercive control, they're not new things and they're huge issues for women in every walk of life. And anybody who thinks that they don't know women who've experienced that should think again. I guarantee you that every one of you knows somebody, if you're not one yourself, you know somebody who's experienced violence or the threat of violence. Uh, and that in itself is a real problem that we don't know, that we don't talk about it as much as we should. Um, things are getting better though. You know, we have laws governing uh, coercive control very recently introduced in Ireland. But as a society, I think we really do have a long, long way to go. I mean, on a much lighter note, but it, it, I nearly choked on my coffee on Saturday morning. I was listening to the business program and there was a woman who's a CEO of a 20 million euro turnover business being interviewed. And the interviewer asked her whether the father of her child was around when she came home from England to take up the new job. I mean, would a man ever be asked that question? I just horrified. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of sexism out there still. Um, I'm just going to follow up on what Trish said about, about social media and that, and I think that 
you know, whether you're male or female, I think starting off in practice nowadays, there's the fear a bit like, you know, what Delia said when she started in practice and um, needing the holy water for some of the cows and, and the prayers. That's normal. I tr tr truly believe that that's normal, that, you know, you have absolute self-doubt when you start off in practice, as every new graduate does until you get that feel for things that you know what they're either going to be okay or no matter what i do they're not going to be be okay but there's a big difference between that normal doubt that goes with you know as you go through your career and as you see the cases and the continued self-doubt and the fear that's out there nowadays from social media that if something goes wrong um, are they going to be up on Facebook berating the vet that they saw last night? And I think that's 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 a, a worry for all of our new graduates coming out now that they have to live with that. They have to live with clients coming in the door who've already Googled things before they've even put the dog or the cat on the table and their expectations are very, very high. So I think they're the, the, the big things that that are different nowadays. When we started off 25 years ago, as naive as we were, as full of normal doubt we were, if we were going to be able to, to, to fill, fill these animals with good health again, um, I think we had an air of confidence, but we certainly didn't have the worry that, you know, they're going to be Googling things on their phones there in front of us correcting you as you're saying something. I don't think we had that sort of pressure. Um, and for that, I think we're, we're very lucky. And I do feel for new and recent graduates nowadays coming out and having to face that, that degree of, of pressure. Yeah, no, I just, just agree. Um, one of my most hated clients were doctors <laughs> because they, they always thought they, they could diagnose and manage the case better than you, even though it was it was not a human, it, it was an animal. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that there is a lot of pressure. I think there's less, I mean, certainly, uh, and the other sort of, uh, I mean, uh, I, my, my, as I said, my first practice was in, in uh, England, in Liverpool, north of Liverpool. Um, and it was a time there was a big shortage of vets in England and a large surplus of vets in Ireland. And it was really great to have, I was recruited by one of my classmates, which was, was really great. Uh, and I remember one client saying um, they needed a vet, uh, but he said, uh, I don't want an Irish one. And then the, the boss said, well, you're out of luck <laughs> because all I have here are Irish ones. <laughs> I actually had to do that call. <laughs> I think it was quite nice when, when, when I got there. And there was more. I mean, not at that practice, because I said I, I had the Dutch uh, superhuman who, who, before me who, who put every farmer in fear. But when I was doing locums in London, uh, I had to go out to a prolapsed uh, uterus. And um, the, the, it was an old farmer and it was you, the usual stuff, you know, you shouldn't send a little girl for this. I was smaller in those days. You shouldn't send a little girl for this job. It needs a man. And I had just, uh, fortunately, as I said, this was 25 years ago, read in the vet record this method of uh, putting them out in the frog position. Uh, and then basically it just like sucks the, the uterus back in and then with a, a bottle and a bit of salt, you're, you're fine. And it was kind of, it, it's such a pleasure to, to, you know, leave him from, this was no job for a woman to, thank you very much, thank you very much, anytime you want to come back, you're very welcome. So things like that have changed. I don't think now people immediately, if they see an Irish or a Polish or a Ghanaian vet think, you know, go, go home, you're, you're not wanted. Or if they see a woman, they're, they're willing to let her give a try. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think things have got better in some ways. Thanks. So, Steve, do you want to come in? Is there any questions that you want to come in with from people who are? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much again. It's a fantastic uh, conversation. Uh, there's a few questions that have come in. One, um, 
uh, which I think has already, you've all touched on it. Uh, and the question is, do you think that all veterinary graduates need to try practice for a while before going into the area of veterinary they are interested in? So Delia, you answered uh, online, so maybe uh, Kira. I certainly found large animal practice gave me a grounding in skills that you're not taught in college. It gave you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, communication skills, you know, having the, the small talk as you're trying to figure out how are you going to calve this cow? Are you actually going to calve it? You know, while you're working, you've got to make skull talk. You've got to communicate with, with your clients as well. I think it gave me that level of, of confidence. Um, as I said, the fact that I had never lost my clinical skills having been in industry for nearly 13 years um, when I needed to go back into practice I realized I was still able to consult I was still able to do a bitch spay um, that I, I didn't go back into large animal practice granted but I still had those skills so it gave me plenty of, of options um, I've certainly seen it as, as I said we're, we're recruiting at the moment and I've been really surprised at the number of um, soon-to-be graduates that are looking to go straight into small animal practice. Um, and I think as well, you know, large animal practice isn't as attractive anymore that, you know, I, I'm not sure if it was ever attractive from a nighttime point of view and, and getting out of the bed and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, so I think people are, are making those decisions um, already and, you know, that's fine if that's that's what you want to do no bother um but i think you you still have to learn the soft skills along the way and the question is where are you going to learn them fantastic thanks Kira. um trish maybe as well you had you'd mentioned that that when you you know you feel still feel as though you you want to go back into practice um even though you, you've left it behind. The other thing though that, and maybe it's it's sort of linked maybe in some way to that question is, you mentioned there the fact of your, you know, scientific skill set and how you could, so obviously you're applying it in practice, but then it's also a skill set that's very broad and, and being a science graduate myself, I think maybe that's something that's sometimes missed. And obviously you've, you've built on that in your career. Oh, I fully agree. I mean, it's, it... I don't think we realize as veterinary graduates what a gift we have um, because it's not only about calving the cow or curing the dog. Um, it's, about, it's about a discipline. It's about a scientific method. It's about understanding the value of questioning and the, the value of, uh, you know, I think it was yourself, Michael, in saying a, a phrase that, I often say to myself, common things are common, you know, differential diagnoses. That's, that is the, the scientific method, it's, or a, an expression of it at least. And those, those skills are very, very valuable and very transferable. They're not limited to being able to cure a, a cat or a dog. I remember being in a, a meeting um, in Brussels about, oh, about five or six years ago, um, and it it was a meeting of um, cabinet members. So there were 28 member states at the time. So 28 people in a room with the Secretariat General and very high powered meeting. And the document under discussion, it was a proposal for a piece of legislation. It related to um, genetic modification. And um, there, was, there was a lot of argument in the parliament about whether uh, genetically modified meat should be labelled accordingly. Um, and I knew that the people around the table had no idea what they were talking about. You know, they, they read the document, but they had no clue as to what the, the reality of, of, you know, the, the, the meat production process was. Um, and I had a very specific line to take, which was from the science and research perspective, as opposed to being a vet. But um, everybody, of course, chipped in with their tuppence halfpenny worth, most of them reading out words that they didn't really understand. And I just asked everybody if they'd put up their hands, if they'd ever actually stood on a dairy farm. And 
or any kind of a farm. And one other person put up their hand around the table. And then I gave my spiel. And I said, and I and I did the as a vet thing. And needless to say, I got my way. So, I mean, it's it, it's a very persuasive place to be, being being able to assimilate information in a scientific way. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, sorry, there's another uh, couple of questions that have come in. Um, um, Delia, if I could address this to you, because you've, you've answered it online, but maybe it would be good to have it out in the open as well, which is that the International Women Day 2021 motto is choose to challenge. Change comes from challenge, and each of you have had your challenges along the way. How have these challenges changed you and the way you go about your daily life and career? So maybe if I start with, with Delia. Oh, yes, I, I gave a brief uh, answer in the Q&A. Um, as I said, we all have challenges, men and women, uh, you know, everyone from every place in the world has challenges. Some challenges we look back on and we can, we can say, yes, that, that made me stronger, that made me think, that made me do things in a different way. Maybe that even opened my eyes to, to, uh, to something, to a new, Part of my career which I wouldn't have seen but other challenges to be honest they 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 make it worse they, they leave you like with eight broken ribs and a hematoma on your liver which is not really maybe you got a lesson from it but but it's hard to say that that was a challenge which which was really improving to your quality of life so I think pick your challenges I would say uh, Go for what interests you. Try and avoid the things which which are really are are, are very low cost benefit and 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 some of those it's hard to see when you're all young and newly graduated and bushy tailed and glowing eyed. Um, but as you get get kind of further in your career, you may get a bit less a bit better at you know identifying these challenges which really are you know not for you or maybe not for this this era uh, and, and and leave to other people um so challenge, challenge uh, they talk about um uh there's an interesting writer and he talks about we talk about resilience uh, which is like bounce back so fragility you throw a, a, a bottle against a glass of wine glass against the wall and it shatters it's fragile you throw a tennis ball against the wall it bounces back it's resilient and then you talk about anti-fragility and those are things which actually get stronger the more you use them so those are things like our bones and muscles that is not just that they 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 bounce back but they're anti-fragile um they the more they're stressed the stronger they get and i think that's a that's a mindset we we need to to encourage in ourselves and in the people who we are kind of we're all on this panel and and you are hosts you know we're all in the now kind of mentoring people um so that's i think the mindset we need to encourage thank you thanks to um, you yeah I'll, I'll just add, add in on that that i suppose what i've learned throughout my challenges is you have to look for the good that comes out of things and sometimes you have to make your own sunshine so the good that came out of me being kicked by a heifer was the number of the farmers we had that went out and invested in really good crushes after my accident and that to me was was great um that you know it it, it Put the fear of God in so many of them, um, but something good came out of something something bad. Um, you know, spending Christmas Day in hospital with your sick child. Um, I had the pleasure of Trisha's company come in and visit me, but I also had Sam McGuire and I had a kiss of Colin Farrell that day as as well. You know, these some some things, as I said, you just have to to make your own sunshine. Um, you know, when we went into this world of having a child with, with special needs, and then we had all the health issues that, that went with it, we went into a very, very small world. And within that world, we've realized that we are very, very lucky. Our daughter came out the end of it, that our daughter is, is still alive. Um, so, 
yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm a great believer, not necessarily at the time, I can't always always do it, but you have to look for the good in things. Um, and then sometimes you just got to make your own sunshine. And, you know, sometimes you need to dance around the kitchen rather than check the emails that you just need to, to live for today. Well, I tell you, that's a fantastic sentiment to have uh, under the challenges that we're all going under through COVID-19. So thanks, uh, Kier. Um, you know, there's, there's another point that's come in here as well that I think you've all, uh, well, as the question says, you've all touched on this earlier. I'll just read the question. You've all touched on this earlier. But what advice do you have for new graduates overcoming imposter syndrome? Maybe, uh, Trish, do you want to um, follow up on that? Yeah, um, the, the imposter syndrome thing is enormous. And guess what? It never goes away. I still have imposter syndrome all these years later, and I probably will until the day I die. Um, and you know something, it's not a bad thing in a way. I think, you know, it, 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 it's another side of the coin of, of making your own sunshine to some extent. I think you can capitalize on and you can make good of that nervousness, that sort of need to perform, that need to, to push yourself that little bit further. Because uh, I think the day that you start to get complacent about being really good at whatever you're doing is probably the day to start thinking about whether that's actually true. For a new graduate, I would say don't sweat the veterinary, frankly. You've got an amazing, you'll have an amazing degree coming out of UCD or coming out of wherever you come out of. Um, you won't know everything. You won't ever know every, and everything, but you will always know somebody who does know more than you do, and you can always pick up the phone. I would say the the key thing for me, for a new graduate, would be to maintain your networks. You know, college is a very intense period of, of your life uh, in terms of friendships. But then life can get in the way after that and people kind of get atomized and they disappear off in different directions. But keep your keep your friends. Uh, you'll have a lot of highs and lows over the course of a career. No matter how stellar it is, we all have our lows and uh, you will need your friends. Um, and, but you'll also need new friends. So, you know, make sure that you create new networks. I remember when we were moving to Warsaw, a veterinary friend of mine, she was joking, but she was only half joking, said to me, oh, you're going to go away and forget us and make new friends. And I said, you know, I was, and I was serious. I said, I've got all the friends I need. I don't need any new friends. I'm not going to make any new friends. Needless to say, I have lifelong friends that we made in Warsaw. Um, but I think just going back to one thing that Delia said about, about resilience, I think, yes, that bounce back is really important and the bounce forward is even more important maybe, but I don't want a life without, I don't want a life without those wine bottles that break. I don't want a life without wine bottles at all, full stop. But, you know, a bit of fragility is no harm and admit that there's a bit of fragility in your life. I think, I think that's, that's important. That's fantastic. Yeah, and in fact, uh, Delia, you mentioned very similar comments in your uh, answer to the Q&A about fake it till you make it. Uh, so, and there is, I suppose, that, that common thread that, you know, don't worry, the imposter syndrome will never go away. So I, I've got it as well. And, but maybe that's, you know, maybe that, uh, as you said, Trish, that um, drive or that, maybe it's reflecting more about that constant search for knowledge and trying to find something else new to, to deal with. I mean, Delia, you've done that many times well, over. One of the nicest things I ever saw was um, uh, a Dublin, again, a court girl who was doing a uh, scene practice with us when, 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 when I was in England. And she had these little, you know, yellow sticky notes about things she was supposed to do. And she, she'd kept them where no one could see them. But I was in a, in a, in the the room and i could i could see what she was working on small animals uh and she had written in large capital letters show them you care <laughs> and they've actually done studies that uh patient this is with humans that patients if they have a doctor with good bedside manners who really seems to to care about them and makes mistakes and does bad medicine that patients prefer them over a doctor who has uh, better, who doesn't make mistakes 
and treats them better, but um, uh, doesn't have that ability to show empathy and show they care. So that's the other thing I would say to new graduates, if you, if you can't. Um, the other thing which I was actually told as a, maybe they're not telling this anymore in UCD, but when I was back there in the 80s, this is what they said. 90% um, of patients are going to get better no matter what you do. And 5% are going to die no matter what you do. <laughs> so it's those 5% you have to, you have to worry about. But that's a professional secret, and we don't tell that to the to the to the owners. Well, um, so, sorry, Clinic. Can I ask? Is it okay if I ask another couple of questions here? I'll, uh, there's uh, maybe linking into that, uh, Trish. There's one for you. Uh, oh, referring back to a comment I think you made earlier on, what was the ethos of Irish civil servants that your employer had identified, and how did this differ? from civil servants in other countries. Oh, by the way, I work for the UK civil service. Okay, well, firstly, you have my sympathies at the moment. <laughs> um, what was it she was after? She was very much after um, independence, apolitical uh, people who, I mean, I'm very political, but with a small p. Um, I often joked with Maura Gagan Quinn that she'd never have hired me if she knew my politics, actually, which is not true. She wanted somebody uh, who had a political radar, but not a not a political party affiliation. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I think she saw that there was a there was a rigor in in administration as well as the the sort of the technical skills that she felt uh, she would get from from a civil servant, somebody also who was going from one bureaucracy to another. Frankly, um, while it wasn't the same bureaucracy, you might be more resilient and capable of dealing with all the nonsense that goes with the bureaucracy. And there is a big difference, I think, between and I would put British and Irish civil servants in the same box. Actually, I think you know we come historically from the same same sort of backgrounds. But um, it's very interesting to watch civil servants from other member states in in Europe. I mean, when I worked in Poland, there were several changes of government, and every time the government changed, the civil servants at a senior level changed, and even mid middle management changed. You know, people who were assistant secretaries or secretaries general disappeared into you know craggy island as soon as there was a there was a government change and people's henchmen got brought in uh, at senior levels so the very significant differences and i think i think it was that sort of consistency and i think what what Maura regarded as a high standard of public service that uh, that she valued fantastic thanks trish um there's a question that's come through from Neve uh, Nestor. Uh, thanks, Neve. Uh, the question is, if you could change something today that would make the world and or the vet profession more equal, what would it be? That's a, that's a big one there, Neve. Um, uh, who, who wants to take that one uh, on? Kira? Yeah. yeah um... I think the, the, the first thing is making sure that, you know, everybody has the, the HR stuff is done. I was talking to Trish about this the, the other day. It, it still amazes me the number of assistants around the country who don't have a contract. And I can only presume if they don't have a contract that there's no such thing as a health and safety statement uh, or a practice manual or, or anything like, like that. So I think it's really important that all of those HR things are done done right. If that's done right, right throughout practice in, in the country, the knock-on things will come from that. People will get their time off in lieu. Um, people will adhere to the working time directive. People will get their downtime because I'm, I'm a big believer that your downtime is very, very important. And I'll say that to all of my staff. I'm very lucky that my staff love coming to work, including myself, but I love going home as, as well. And learning to switch off, that once, once you're out of here, um, that you switch off and you don't have to switch back on until you're back, back in again. 
But if you're not getting your downtime, if you're worried about not being paid, you know, if you haven't had a contract and you don't know if your salary is going to be paid this month, if you're going to be paid overtime. And um, so I think there's a lot that the veterinary profession in Ireland can still do to pull their boots up on, on that. And it's one of those things that makes me a little bit ashamed of the of of the profession um, that there's, yeah, as I said, it, it scares me when I hear assistants don't have contracts. So that's, that's the first thing I do is I would love to, to sort out all of the HR. I don't think I ever had a contract and my first job for my first two years, I was on call every Friday night, including when I had the weekend off, I was on one weekend and two. And after two years, I realized <laughs> That being on on Friday night when I was, you know, off for the weekend was not a very good deal. And then I renegotiated, but it took me two years. But for those of us outside, like, like, like myself and Patricia, um, outside the actual practice world, where I think a lot of vets go, from my year, maybe a third of us or more are not in conventional practice. We're in research or academia or, or, or government. Um, I think a lot of it is too about flexibility and, and that's something which this COVID year has taught us that there's lots we do in, in person and in, in meetings which we could actually do virtually. Um, and it's that balance between if you, you don't you know, meet face to face at all with people that's pretty, pretty un unhealthy. But at the same time, how much of our time is wasted in you know, meetings which, which don't really matter and could we be more efficient working from home, having having Zoom meetings like we're doing now? Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Trish, do you want to add yeah, on? Yeah, briefly, I mean, gosh, there's so many things one would change to make the world a better place. I mean, I, um, I suppose on the day that's in it, apart from smashing the patriarchy, um, maybe one little bit of smashing the patriarchy, uh, and I'm not really talking about myself because I've had limited experience in this, but I just look at people I work with and around and friends and so on. Women do most of the caring. They care for kids, they care for the elderly, they care for their neighbors, they, they, they do the lion's share of it. And that takes its toll on people's personal lives. It takes its toll on their careers. Um, if a man is a single parent, he's practically beatified for being such a wonderful selfless individual women tend to get the opposite let's say um so that's something i would change i would change the balance of responsibility for caring for the vulnerable um and i think that would help the world certainly quite a lot excellent thanks thanks trish um let me think uh Kleena, I can keep on asking questions here, uh, or do you want me to hand back to you, or? We can keep asking questions, but I don't want to delay these people if they've all kind of heading home and saying it's now gone fast, <laughs> a lot longer than we thought it was going to last. So I don't want to, to presume that you're all kind of, yes, we keep going. Um, perhaps you've had enough. And <laughs> well, do you know, there's one question that's come in. There's another question from, from Maura McElroy that maybe I could just pose it and then we can start wrapping up it's what if any long-term impact do you think that the switch to female dominance will have on the veterinary profession uh, I it's going to be bad for farm animal medicine that's already coming coming up you know horses and small animals yes uh, women are very very keen to go there they're not so keen on large animal medicine. Um, and we're seeing that already in America, Canada, other, other isolated places. Uh, then the other thing I think is, is obviously that women are going to have, have be more likely to go on maternity leave and have children and be carers. And I, I know Patricia said, wouldn't it be nice if we could turn the world? I don't think we can turn the world on its head like that overnight. <laughs> I think it is just kind of natural that men seek status and women 
women tend to, to, to look more for, for relationships. That has been a, a, a factor in every society studied by every anthropologist uh, for the past, you know, 100 years covering thousands of societies. So in an ideal world, yes, but in the real world, you know, I'm, I'm afraid women will naturally or unnaturally, but somehow We'll, we'll end up, and I'm in this position now with, with parents, we'll, we'll end up with, with having to do a little, you know, a bit, bit more of the caring burden. Um, so yes, so how do we manage a profession when we see a shift towards small animals and, and um, companion animals, and also a profession where we have to accommodate that women may take more time off at different times to deal with different things in their life uh, than their, their perhaps men would, um, and yet try and make it easier for them to get back if they want and, and stay, stay away if they don't. Thanks, Delia. Kira, you tried to get in. Yeah, we've, we've certainly faced it. Like I've got a, a team of 18 vets um, and there was huge shock and surprise last year when we actually took on two male vets. Um, but certainly what it's, the, you know, the big thing for us is that we have to facilitate um, part-time working. We have to be as flexible as possible with working hours. Um, we have to prepare for maternity leaves that, you know, that's sort of our our business planning at the start of the, the year when you have um, 10 young vets all in their 30s and we've got a couple of weddings this year and things like that. It's it's the, the circle of life, but it's the things that you have to be prepared for and thinking, yeah, we're probably going to have to recruit again. Um, and then, you know, like nearly all of our um, ladies who had, had babies last year have taken unpaid leave. They've taken the extended leave. They've taken new parents leave. And um, so they're gone for the guts, guts of a year. Um, and then we need to look at inducting them back into the practice and things have changed. So, look, change is, is a challenge, um, but this is something that all practices have to face nowadays. And, you know, if you're not able to, we are going to be stuck. Simple as. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Trish, did you want a, a final word on that? Um, slightly slightly off the the practice uh, point i suppose or or even civil service point but there's a there's a sort of a broader um thing to ponder when when a, a profession shifts from one dominance of one one gender to another and there's quite there's quite a body of of research on uh, the feminization of professions and the relative salary downward pressure on salaries that that happens to happen when that happens if you know what i mean so i would be worried that um the the value of the profession in terms of remuneration will suffer a, is suffering probably a downward pressure and what you know i'm not blaming women for bringing down salaries in in the veterinary professions but it's it, it is a feature of of uh professions that are dominated by women is that they tend to be less well paid, which says quite a lot in itself on International Women's Day. Yeah, and just to add, add to that, I can um, or remember an annual review I had a number of years back when I was working in industry. And uh, for anybody who's who's worked in, in corporate words, you, you know what the, the annual reviews are like, that you have to judge yourself and then your line manager will judge you and you, you meet in, in the middle. And I said I was grand essentially, that I sort of put myself in the middle for everything that I was doing, a, a grand old job. As it turned out, I was one of the best in, in the team. So because I hadn't said I was doing so well, but I said I was here, we could only meet in the middle. That my manager was telling me I should have been up here. And that was going to have a knock-on effect on my salary rise, on my bonus, and all of those, those sorts of things. So because I didn't want to big up myself, it affected my salary. Um now, as I said, I was lucky to have a, a good line manager who told me 
the whole truth as it was. Um, so it was a very different review that I had the, the following year that I went in and said, yeah, I'm doing a good job. And I just wonder if the women in the profession are confident enough. I have a feeling they're all doing a very good job, but are they confident enough to be shouting that they are doing such a good job? Yeah, just quickly, my, my husband is, a, is an American um, and I've had a couple of operations in the last few years uh, under American insurance. And I think if, if uh, Irish and British veterinarians now dominated by women were to, to set up a, in a libertarian frame of mind, were to set up an alternative health care in the United States, we could do all of those operations uh, at maybe one hundredth of, of the cost and make a very nice profit too. So yeah, maybe we are selling ourselves short. I, I think I think that's the thing that, that women do tend to do. We don't tend to blow our own trumpets enough. So I think uh, maybe that's a, a message to take home. We are doing a lot better than we think we are. So I think that's Kleena, can I just, just add that I don't think we can have a meeting like this without mentioning the first woman who broke the glass ceiling for us all. Um, that, you know, as uh, the year I was president of Veterinary Ireland, my last official um, outing was to unveil a uh, plaque to Aileen Cust. And I think all of us are here standing on her shoulders, that she was the first woman to get on the register um so you know she was really the ultimate woman who did choose to challenge um the whole patriarchy so i think we we have to remember her today and god of prize in theology too well i suppose i think that's the end of the question so leave you all go um i would like to thank you all so much for for um yeah taking part in this webinar it's been great and um, hopefully when COVID is over we'll be able to have maybe a drink together or something and trees at last and have a, a nicer more social interaction but it has been really good and it is very much appreciated and uh, your perspectives have been really uh, enlightening so I'd like to thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure thank you. Thanks yeah, thank for you the all. invitation. Thank you. I, I was going to come in at the end and thank everybody as well. Okay. I mean, I, I'm sorry, because it's down here and I have to do it. Um, well, listen, this has just been wonderful. It, uh, um, thank you all. Thank you, Patricia, Kira, Delia, Kleena and, and Steve. Um, our three panelists, your stories have been inspirational, truly inspirational. I've been moved um, and entertained and, you know, it, it's just been wonderful. So um, on behalf of the school, I'd just like to thank you um, from everyone and everyone who attended, thank you as well. So, Gurumila Maagov, thank you all very much. Slav. Slav.